Well, the AIM Healthcare Foundation was founded in 1998. Uh, there was an HIV outbreak in the adult entertainment industry, and it was there was a lot of HIV going around. There were several cases. Um, one very important one started on January 7th, 1998. It was an actress named Trish Devereaux, and she she did a sort of a um, a genealogy for me of all the people that she worked with. And I really was sort of in the right place at the right time or the wrong place at the wrong time, however you want to look at that, because I, I had been out of the adult entertainment industry for a couple of years. I had been back in school and I was just graduating a program from a hospital that enabled me to start a clinic and to do HIV counseling, drug and alcohol counseling. But when all these folks were coming down with HIV, they needed someone that could find a solution. And the for-profit doctors in the United States that were working here with the industry were only doing it to make money. They really weren't doing it for a solution, you know. They, and what this called for was a very, very special solution, a special test, a monitoring system. And um, what we did basically was we used a company's warehouse and 300 of us sat in a room and argued <laughs> for like three hours and I brought in educators from UCLA, AIDS Healthcare Foundation, my friend Dr. Stephen York who later became the medical director for the AIM Healthcare Foundation, the other existing doctors and that were already sort of servicing the clinic, I mean the, uh, that were servicing the industry at that time and they came up with some some various ideas and they tried these ideas for the testing and it didn't work, they were picking the wrong type of testing and it was kind of a mess. And I sat down and um, just like one of those things where God gives you what you need when you need it, you know? And I got the science behind um, a lot of the um, DNA testing that exists now. And I really looked at the type of sequencing that is available for HIV testing and confirmation testing. And I sort of was able to move it around and I came up with the PCR DNA test and a monitoring system to be best every 30 days. And that was uh, myself, Dr. Stephen York, and um, Dr. Henry Chang, who worked with David Ho, who invented the Proteus inhibitors and AZT and things like that. So I had some really great people to work with. And um, they went away and they left me in a room alone. <laughs> with a lot of cigarettes and a lot of coffee. And I sat down with a bunch of names and a bunch of lists and I went back to the uh, producers and the manufacturers and, we, and then we had another meeting again uh, with myself and the educators that I had brought in. And it was kind of clear that I was sort of chosen to give back in this particular area at this time. And I, um, I started a monitoring system every 30 days by PCR DNA, which is an early detection HIV test. We can tell if you've been exposed to the virus within 10 days. Because the antibody test, clearly HIV doesn't show up for six months. It can hide up to six months. Can you imagine how many sex partners these people are going to have in six months? Tons. Upwards of 40, maybe more. This is not a law or a standard by the state of California, by any health, uh, occupational health, health government service at all. Uh, it's basically an industry-wide regulation that I started, Dr. Stephen York started, and the industry has adapted because it works so well that if you don't have it, you don't work. And, and that's because we can't track the disease. We have an extensive database here at the AIM Healthcare Foundation. When someone comes up HIV positive, they're told that day. Uh, they bring in a list of their partners. We contact their first and second generation partners. We put it in our database. We hit a button. We can tell when they've been exposed, who we have to call to put on quarantine, to tell them to wait a period of time for retesting. And we eliminate the spread of HIV very quickly. The last time we had an outbreak, uh, we had someone that had uh, 17 partners in three different countries. We found all those partners within six hours and retested them all by quarantine and confirmatory testing. Within 17 days, they were all cleared out negative. So we're bad motherfuckers. You know, we do our job really well. This is probably 
for this group, the best monitoring system in the world that exists right now. Well, what happened was, is that to start this, we set up next to an agency. And because to start a system, and I had to get money from the producers, enough money to start this system rolling. It's a very expensive process and it's a very expensive test. So I set up next to a talent agency and when people just walked out, I just grabbed their arm and drew blood. And once we did that for a couple of months, people got the idea. But now when you just start an HIV testing facility, you find out that people want drug and alcohol services. They want to know how to tell their kids about what they're doing for a living. They want to know how long they can stay in the industry without getting burnt out. They want to know, how do I leave the industry when I'm ready? They want to make sure that they have GYN services. They want to know and be tested about other sexually transmitted diseases. So we, we had to start and form an agency. And um, at that time, I was really pretty much funded by the producers and I was working under another nonprofit agency that was controlled by the producers and manufacturers. They did not want me to go on and form a community-based organization. They wanted me to cut it. They wanted me to farm my protocols out to the for-profit clinics at that time and just be a good little girl and kind of go away, you know. And I got so fucking mad, you know. Um, because for the first time in my life did I really feel like I was I was giving back exactly where I came from and very few people get the gift of life to do that in their life and second of all I thought how can these bastards that have been telling me how to fuck all my life <laughs> tell me what to do now when it has nothing to do with having sex and I really got mad at them and and even though they had been funding me and to a certain degree they still fund me I still really inside, I feel like they're the bad guys, you know? I really, really do. I mean, I've, I've been in this industry 25 years, uh, going on 26. I'm not acting anymore, but I survived a 16-year-old heroin addiction. I survived an attack on my life by a crazed fan. I've been in over 2,000 movies, got paid one time for each movie and had them duplicated all over the world. So I thought, you know, I don't know why I'm going to listen to these guys when they tell me that I can't help people. And so I have a very strong issue and I'm in a very difficult position as the administrator of the AIM Healthcare Foundation because I walk a very fine line because they fund me, they exist with me, we have to coexist and yet I'm an advocate for the talent and I have to see every day the tragedies of what can happen from working in the adult entertainment industry too long. Because if you come in this industry, you can find people that will take you all the way up to the top and you can find people that will take you all the way to the bottom. And that means that they will not tell you your rights and responsibilities, that you have the right to use a condom. You have the right to choose who you want to work with, when you want to work. See, if AIM Healthcare didn't exist, they kind of wouldn't know that, would they? So they could pay people less money and, and uh, the talent would be expendable. And I'm really tired of the talent being expendable at this point. I'm, I'm doing a lot of public speaking in City Hall and in Sacramento and I'm sort of looks like I'm taking the path toward advocacy for well, this group of people. Inside. I have been through everything that we counsel for. <laughs> I have been exposed to HIV. I have I've had every sexually transmitted disease known to man. <laughs> I, I know what it's like to work for a scumbag producer. I know what it's like to have a check bounced on you and have already performed the act and have tell someone tell you that it's no good. I also do know what it's like to experience the joy of wealth and fame in this industry. I, I had the opportunity of being a big star in this industry and traveling all over the world and making tons of money and tons of movies and really taking the control of the sex, you know. And that's, um, that's really what got me started and I find that a necessary common denominator with people in this industry is that they've come from a background that although may not be abusive it's usually a single only child or a single parent family people that are adopted people that are generally requiring large amounts of attention are drawn to this industry I mean if you have to have sex in public you need lots of attention and you need it now you know? <laughs> And porn will give that to you. And that can be a great thing for you if you know how not to let it do you. Uh, how I personally got into the industry was I was, um, 
I was very young and I was already working as a fashion model. I was very pretty and beautiful and thin and I was doing some commercials and some off-Broadway plays. I even did a Broadway play for a little while. And, um, you know, it just wasn't enough. I had something inside me that told me it just wasn't enough. Although I wasn't having to be a prostitute or be a waitress, which meant I was probably doing better than most actors out there. I just didn't get it, you know, I didn't, I didn't feel like it was enough. And when someone approached me to do an adult film, I thought, well, wow, I can say fuck you to the Catholic Church and my parents at the same time. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, um, and there it was a couple years later, because this was in the day of film, there was no, uh, back then it was 35 millimeter, you had to wait a year or two for your first movie to come out. And I remember seeing my, my vagina 16 feet high on the silver screen and I thought, wow, that's me, that is so great, you know, this is wonderful. And I found within that industry, I found a lot of camaraderie. I found the sisters that I never had. I found the perverted fathers I always wanted that I never had. I found friends and fantasy and family that I don't think would have been available to me otherwise. This has been a very incredibly special journey for me. Um, everything really makes sense in my life. Um, I, I uh, put down drugs and alcohol almost five years ago. And um, after going back to school and clearly being the person to be able to put something like this in place, there's never been anything like this before. And now I've been doing this for three years and I'm bloody exhausted. I am tired. I'm, I'm burnt out and I'm finding that because it's such a special niche that I have and that I'm able to give to others, it's very hard to delegate to a staff to do. There's so much love there. There's so much a part of me when I see people sitting in my chair that I'm counseling. I see me at 17 years old when I started not having a clue of what I'm about to do. I think that the industry is so vast now. It's huge. It's an eight billion dollar, you know, there's no exact figure. They say between eight and twelve billion dollars. And it's basically made off the backs of about 500 folks every month. And no one is going to really tell you what you're worth. What is that sex act worth? When you need money quickly and it's not a big deal to you, you might underestimate yourself. Um, on the other hand, um, there are girls that come in here and really follow great guidelines. They set great boundaries and set wonderful standards and do very well and leave and go on into the real estate business in five years. It does happen. There's only 25% that really get paid what they want. And the rest has such low self-esteem that they don't know that they can ask for that. You see, that's the trick. So it's either they're going to come here first and thank God, you know, I can tell them, you know, this is what you're worth, this is your choices. And, but if they're needing money fast and they've been on the welfare system, no matter how beautiful they are, anything is going to be better than that. Um, they get to have sex, wow, it's a lot of fun, you know, and, and, and all you know is what you're told. So when, you're, when you come here, you're told about prevention education, that you can get whatever you want in this industry, that you can have a career and leave this industry if you want to. Um, but if you're not making a stop at the AIM Healthcare Foundation first, you may fall into the hands of prey for some of these other, and there's some real bottom feeders out there. I mean, they're just not going to tell you. Why would they? And who are you going to go to? I mean, I can't even get funding for a wonderful nonprofit organization that deals with HIV and STDs every single day here. And I, I have trouble getting funding simply because people say, well, you know, they're in that business. They kind of deserve it, you know. I mean, that's, that's what people really, they just don't want to hear it. I mean, they, they'll rather jack off to it with one hand, but they're going to push it away with the other because, hey, backbone is the denial of the, you know, America, you know, and, and uh, excuse me, denial is the backbone of the United States. And, and denial is indeed the backbone of pornography. Nobody really wants to clearly take a look at what's happening here. All women are not exploited and degraded in pornography. Regardless of where we come from, we take control of what we want to do. We do have choices. There is prevention education out there. There's a facility now, and we're well known throughout the world with our policies, procedures, protocols. I've been in Budapest, Hungary to start this clinic. I've done education seminars all over the world on 
awareness about working in pornography for other sex workers. Um, this is a career now. Like it or not, people like myself and Amber Lynn and Portia Lynn and Ginger Lynn and all the Lynn sisters and <laughs> Marilyn Chambers, we've made this a career now. So when you're entering this, you really do know exactly what you're getting yourself into. And it's a choice. It's an occupational choice. Pornography is an occupational choice. It's not somewhere where the downtrodden end up. No one holds a gun to your head. You can leave at any time. The issues become addiction to the money, addiction to the fame, and possibly addiction to the sex. Those are the three difficulties on getting out. But this is something that it's an occupational choice. And um, it's a job like anything else, but it's not. I, I stopped performing last year um, because I was doing a couple things here and there. And I really sort of was doing it still for the money. And I was, I was able to pick and choose. And I really wanted everything. I wanted to be a counselor. I wanted to run this. I still wanted to do this. But I can't do everything. And I am changing. And I do have issues about pornography. And I, I, really, I really want to try to have success financially in other areas of my life that I went to school for now, other than fucking. Because I know I can do that. I mean, you know. And I'm not saying it's a bad thing, it's a great career. But I'm, I'm saying that in your mid-40s, you might want to think about doing other things. And I've been, you know, I've been blessed with a, a really sharp mind and a, and a good head start. I'm very articulate. And, and for me, I want to push myself to do other things. Um, which is why sometimes I really feel stifled here. And I'm also in love. And I've never really, for me, monogamy, in porn, monogamy means that you're with the person in your private life, but you're still working with having sex with people in your porn life. And I never had a full-on monogamous relationship before, not honestly. I mean, I lied about it. I had a couple of those. But, um, and I always wanted to do that. I wanted to give myself the opportunity to break away from the industry so I could really look at it. And now that I haven't done it for almost a year, I'm looking back and I'm seeing a lot of things differently. To sum up, my experience in the industry would be very difficult. It depends on the day. <laughs> it really does because I'm at that age where I'm realizing so many things in my life. I'm realizing things that I might have done differently. No regrets. I mean, I'm not going to hurt myself, you know. Uh, but I'm realizing that there might have been things that I could have done differently. And I'm also realizing that there are things that I had really good. And I think that pornography served me very well in terms of the heroin addiction because it prevented me from doing things that might have hurt myself or other people. I think that I had a tremendous support group here because no matter what I was doing or no matter